Well, we're going through a, a series that we just started last week and looking into how Jesus did relationships. And last week we looked at how relationships are the most important thing. That's the top priority. Love God with all that we are and love your neighbor of yourself. And today we're going to go a little deeper into the second part of that, of loving loving your neighbor as yourself. So to do that, we're going to start with a A scripture that you've all heard before, um, heard many times, but I ask for us to give us our attention to God's word for Luke 10, beginning with verse 25. Behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What's written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind and your neighbor is yourself. And he said to him, You've answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn, took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him. And whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. Well, this passage is rather familiar to us, isn't it? And, you know, there's a danger with familiar passages that we just stop hearing them at some place and and the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan and the Prodigal Son, probably the best known two pieces of scripture in the New Testament that there are. And because of that, we may have a difficulty hearing this. I mean, the the Samaritan, their law is named after the Good Samaritan. You, you, you know, if you're in society now, most states, uh, first the laws were made so that if you came to the aid of someone who was having a problem, that they couldn't sue you if you messed something up. So, you know, maybe you're doing CPR or something and the guy dies. They can't sue you for that. It's called the Good Samaritan Law. And then we've increased that now to where in most states that if you see something bad happening to someone and you don't at least dial 911, uh, they can place charges against you for not responding, for not being a good Samaritan. So we probably are in the position where we have heard this so much that we think that there's, well, there's nothing new here for us. And and yet, you know, God's word oftentimes uh, to us is kind of like a mirror where we see ourselves in something. And that's always when uh, the the word has really struck the mark is when we can see ourselves in Scripture and it's kind of like um, a small child when a small child first recognizes that that is their uh, image in the mirror. When you have, you know, a, a one-year-old or whatever, and they look and they go, "Oh, whoa, wait!" You know, that's me. And the whole world opens up to them that I am a person. You know, I can see myself. And at the best of times, that's what God's word does for us: is that we look at Scripture. And we see ourselves, and it's never the same after that. So I hope that that happens to us, even though this is so familiar. Jesus is having another discussion with a religious lawyer, and scribes were men who made their living off of interpreting Old Testament law. They would look through the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, and then they would determine what God required them to do and what they were prohibited from doing in order to stay in covenant with God. And that's what a scribe did. And this scribe is laying out, kind of laying in wait for Jesus, and no doubt thinking that he's going to embarrass this uneducated rabbi 
that's from Jerusalem or from Galilee, and that you know he's going to the scribe's going to show his superior intellect and his educational uh, advancement, and that he is going to put this guy to shame. So the young lawyer begins a conversation with one of the greatest questions of, of all humanity. How do you get eternal life? No matter where you're born, what religious upbringing you have, that's always a question, is how do you get eternal life? And I kind of admire Jesus' restraint. Jesus doesn't say to him, well, that's really kind of a stupid question, young lawyer. Uh, the nature of an inheritance is that you do nothing for it. You don't have to do anything to get an inheritance. You just receive it, right? So really, that's kind of silly. But Jesus didn't say that. Jesus says, well, you've been a lawyer. You know the law. Well, what's your opinion? What, what do you think? And the lawyer gave the obvious answer, one that's not difficult at all, that to, eternal, to enter eternal life, you're to love God with all that we are and to love the neighbor as yourself. And that was common Jewish teaching at that time. Simple answer. But then he gets kind of smarty pants. And he says, ah, but who's your neighbor? You know, wanted the definition of terms here. Well, we know how to do that. Um, surely sometime in your life you've read God's word. It's been very clear as to what to do. And then you said, well, but what does that word really mean? You know, let's unpack this. Let's, let's form a little discussion group. And, and, you know, let's, or let's chat about this online and have a discussion on this and see what this really means. And in that spirit, the lawyer asked the question, who's my neighbor? And when Jesus answers the question, he doesn't give some long theological doctrine to him, you know, about neighbor. He doesn't even say, well, now there's seven, several Greek words for love here, young lawyer. He doesn't do that on him. He just tells a story. And the story, the parable, is a, is a trap for the young man and for all who hear it. For the neighbor, we learn that we must love. The neighbor is everyone, and the neighbor is someone. And everyone means that no one is beyond the limits of my love or God's love in me. And someone means that I can only practice love with the person that I'm with. I can't practice love with someone that I'm not with. And so when we speak of loving people in these grand, inclusive, kind of ideological terms, it has no meaning unless we love the person that we're with. And that is someone. And the meaning here for Jesus is clear that everyone is to be loved as well, meaning that we cannot limit God's love and our love based on anything. And so when I start limiting the word neighbor to some group smaller than everyone, I've missed the meaning of Jesus' words. And let's be honest here, it's so natural and so human for us to limit our love, our engagement with people. When it comes to limiting the term neighbor, we turn everyone to almost everyone. But we have a difficult time loving everyone. I think for two common reasons. The first one is because of our differences. Uh, the, the Jews hated Samaritans. It, it's hard for us to understand how much they hated Samaritans. But the Jews hated Samaritans. And it goes back about 600 years. You may know some of this stuff. But about 600 years earlier, the Assyrians had come into the northern part of what we call Israel. And Israel at that time was divided into a north and a south. There's no test on this later, but it might be, mean something to you. Who knows? The, there was the, the northern tribes, the ten tribes, there had been a civil war and they'd become what was called Israel. The southern had just two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, and they were known as Judah. And these two people, these, although they had been together in one nation, they didn't get along. The Syrians came in and conquered the north. And instead of carting them off into exile, what they did was they, they brought their people in. The Assyrians came and lived in the cities where the northern tribes had lived. And they commingled, they intermarried, they mixed their cultures. And the Jews in the south, in the southern kingdom, 
looked down on the Assyrians because they were mixed. They had mixed with the Gentiles. And so at this time, 600 years later, these two people didn't talk to each other. They hated each other. And so Jesus knew what he was doing when he chose a Samaritan to be cast as the good guy in his, in his parable because a young lawyer who asked the question, who, would, who was a neighbor, he would have hated the Samaritans. Now, I think there's a core spiritual reason as to why loving everyone, regardless of our differences, is so important. This goes beyond who's in this parable. It's just a core spiritual uh, issue. And that is, we cannot love God with all if we decide or, or live in such a way that we think that we're better than other people. We just can't do it. We can't love God. We can't be a recipient of His grace. We can't abide in Christ. We can't walk in Christ. We can't daily be in Christ. If we've decided that there's a group of people that don't deserve His love, because that is a, a toxin to grace. So we can't have both at the same time. We can't have grace in us and at the same time be the ones that choose and pick who we think that God loves and God doesn't love. They don't, they don't mix. Why? Because God is a God of grace. Our salvation is one of grace. God gives it to us freely. And we can't be in that salvation. We can't be with God and at the same time be picking and choosing who we love or who God loves. You just simply can't do it. So at the very same time when we are saying America would be better off if blank were not here. And you, you can fill the, you can fill in the word there. We could, we could put, hmm. I want to make sure I step on everybody's toes equally this morning. So let's put Mexicans in there. If Mexicans weren't in America, we'd be better off. If gays weren't in America, we'd be better off. If African Americans weren't here, we'd be better off. If Democrats weren't here, we'd be better off. If Republicans were here, we'd be better off. If liberals weren't here, if fundamentalists weren't here, we'd be better off. I mean, you could just go on and on. And at the same time as we are sorting out people by their differences, we are blocking God's grace to us. We can't do that and in the same moment be living in grace. Do you get what I'm saying? Because God is a God of grace. And so if we are not living as a person of grace... We can't be in God at the same time. So Jesus is teaching us that if we want to receive grace, if we want to inherit eternal life, we, have, we must see even Samaritans and Muslims and Southern Republicans and racists and supremists and rich people and welfare people and fundamentalist Christians and on and on and on. We have to see them as equal and all in God's grace. He sees them as the world, remember? And that world that God sent his son to love. So there's the first difference. The second reason why we limit our love to some instead of all is our fear. In cultures and all times, um, it's been the practice to divide people into good people and bad people. Uh, I think that shows a common human need to do so that's based on fear. People identify themselves, we identify ourselves by what we're not, not so much by what we are. And I think that we have the reason to do that. I mean, we're, we're not, and again, we could put in, we're not black, Mexican, gay, Republican, Democrat. We could put those blanks in there. And so therefore, then I am somebody. And the thing is, is the reason that we have the need to do that is because we're not really certain about who we are. And so we, we have the fear that we might be like them. So we want to make sure we differentiate ourselves from them. And today there's this growing sense of fear and vulnerability and, and people are afraid, I would assume, more than before. I don't know. I haven't lived in those other times. But don't you sense a growing fear of vulnerability today? And to counter that fear or that vulnerability, we put people into groups. 
Um, English author P.D. James said, Perfect love may cast out fear, but fear is remarkably potent in casting out love. And boy, it is. Now, I, I guess the most, I was still trying to think of examples for this, examples that wouldn't embarrass myself too much. And have you ever gone to look at some of the posts on websites like blog sites? And I mean, it, it could be a... Uh, a sports site, or it could be a Christian site or a political site. Do you ever read some of the anonymous posts that people put there? Oh, my gosh. You know, they're meaner than I am. Some of the things that people say, you know, all UK fans are faggots. And put that down there. We obviously know it's not right. It's all U of L fans, right? Amen. <laughs> And they post things like that down there on those websites anonymously. You know, you can do that. And it's like, you're so stupid. You're so dumb. You bigot, you know. Or here's one. It's obvious that you know nothing, that you're some lame loser who stays home every night posting on his computer. Well, aren't you kind of doing the same thing, you know? (laughs) But you look at some of these posts and it's like, wow, these are people talking to people. And yet, since it's removed, they're not in front of us. People say things that are just, I mean, they're just, it's just ridiculous. Why do they do that? Well, it's fear. It's fear that they're afraid that what they're saying about other people might actually kind of be true about myself. See? And that's why we divide people into groups and classes and place labels on them. And the truth is, is that we are always the others. You know, you're always talking about the other people. But we are always so close to being an other people. We are those people. Most of us are just maybe one paycheck or or one drug-addicted son or or one mental health diagnosis or one serious illness or one sexual assault, one drinking binge or one night of unprotected sex or one affair away from being those people, those other people, the ones that we don't trust, the ones that we pity, the ones that we don't let our children be with, the ones who bad things happen to, the ones we don't want living next to us. On YouTube, there's a series entitled Good Samaritan. You ought to Google it. It's, you could watch two or three videos there. This guy's done these series where what they do is they'll have somebody pretend to be hurt in public in a crowded street and then see who helps, okay? And they had a man that looked homeless, you know, and he fell down in the middle of the street and everybody walks around him. Everybody, very few. Finally, somebody comes after a while and sees if he's okay. But a very small percentage of the public even stopped. They walked around him. Now, he did the same thing with a man in a business suit and it was exactly flipped. Everybody stops. Oh, a businessman is hurt. We have to pay attention to him. But it's fear. I don't want to catch his homelessness. I don't want to catch what's happened to him. You know, and we'll rationalize that. Well, evidently he deserved that. You know, he's probably lazy. He doesn't he doesn't work, you know, something like that. What Jesus says to do is he says, Well, what you need to do is you need to move in next door to him. See? If you're going to love your neighbor and there's your neighbor, you need to move in next door to him. Take him to the inn, put him up for a night, spend the night with him like the Good Samaritan. Leave a couple days' wages there. Give him your credit card and say, if that's not enough, you've always got my credit card to use. That's in essence what the guy did. Because the kingdom of God is for them. Because really, you are them. There's no difference. When God looks at us, there's no difference between a homeless man and us. No difference at all. We're all in need of grace. For all have fallen short of the glory of God. And Jesus says, I have come for all, not just for those that measure up to the standards. So first, love your neighbor as yourself, everyone, no exclusions. I think we get that. The second part of this is love your neighbor, someone. So now let's just not think of neighbor being just a class of people, of everyone in the world, kind of anonymous, but now neighbor is someone that's next to me. 
See, one point that we might uh, take on this story would be if we would uh, come up to the man who had been mugged on the side of the road and interview him. I can imagine if we might go to that man who's lying there in a pool of blood along the side of the road and say, uh, uh, pardon me, sir, or we're kind of doing a theological survey here. Um, we're, we're not bothering you too much right now. I wonder, from your perspective down there, all beating, beaten up and bloody along the side of the road, uh, who would you say is your neighbor right now? Right. Well, the guy's going to say, my neighbor is anybody that comes along that can help me. That's who my neighbor is, right? Just about anybody coming down the road would be my neighbor right now because I'm in need of help. Just about anybody. And that's the way it is, you know. Um, you and I are driving down the road and the car begins to sputter and, it, you know, we've got plenty of gas, but it's dark and it's a country road and we're over along the side of the road and, you know, well, who would be our neighbor? Well, anybody that could come along and help right now, right? Anybody that would drive along that road. But when it's the other fellow's car that's stuck along the side of the road and we're driving by, then now who's our neighbor? Am I his neighbor? Well, I don't really know much about cars. You know, we don't know who he is. You know, it might be a trap of some kind, couldn't it? And, that, and the story with the Good Samaritan could have very easily, it was a common thing that they did, that a man would lie out in the middle of the road and appear to be hurt and the other guys would wait behind the rocks, and when somebody, somebody started to help, they'd jump out and mug him, take his stuff. Jesus says, love your neighbor, someone. In the story, the people who occupy center stage are a priest and a Levite. If that poor wretch beside the road were making a list of candidates for neighbor, the priest and the Levite would have been up at the top. Because, you see, tradition says that in every good Jewish home in the morning, they quoted these two verses of Scripture. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. That was the common thing to do in a Jewish home before you left for the day. Those were the commandments for the day. Who would best qualify as a neighbor? Well, someone that knew the law. A priest, a Levite, in other words, a preacher and a seminary professor, but Jesus said that the priest came down the road, saw the man pass by on the other side. Strange, isn't it? The last thing that Lashana Calloway saw before she died was people literally stepping over her to continue shopping as if nothing had happened. Uh, she, Calloway was, was stopped to shop at a convenience store in Wichita, Kansas about five years ago when she was stabbed in an altercation that was taking place there in the convenience store. As she lay dying, a surveillance camera recorded no less than five people actually stepped over her body to continue down the store's aisles. Only one stopped briefly, and that was to take a picture of her with a cell phone. Gordon Basham, the police spokesman, said it was tragic to watch. They said the fact that people were more interested in taking a picture with a cell phone and shopping for snacks than helping this innocent young woman is frankly revolting. That's just one of so many instances like this that happen in our culture. Examples of the negative side of this, of us saying that no one is my neighbor, even that person that's hurting in front of me. It's hard to understand how that could happen. Could one human being see another human being in such desperate need and do absolutely nothing to help him? Well, the same thing's been played out in so many places. It's not regional, it's not American, it's not European. His problem is not my problem. I don't know what to do. I'm too busy. She probably deserved what happened. But Jesus, you see, teaches us how to love one person at a time. We might miss this if we're just reading the Bible through. Jesus could only physically be in one place at a time, right? He couldn't be everywhere. He had limited himself by a physical body when he was here on the earth. And how did he love? Well, he didn't sort people out into classes and say, let me love the good ones first. You know, he loved the person that was in front of him. He simply loved people as the opportunity presented itself. If he was in Jerusalem, he loved the people in Jerusalem. If he was Capernaum, he loved the people in Capernaum. 
His mission was to bring salvation to the entire world. And yet, we need to get this, he did it one person at a time based on the person that he was with that moment. So to follow his example, we love the people we are around in everyday circumstances of life. And we need to let that sink in. It's more difficult than what we might think. See, to love someone, the one that's before us right now, the person that we're with right now, means that we will first love, love those who are closest to us. And that means families, right? Now, most of us are going to say, oh, my family's great. But you know, every family gets weird at times, don't they? Not, not everybody in every family is lovable all the time. And we know them. We know what they do. We, we know why they do things. That makes it much more difficult. I can't believe he's doing that again. We've been through this so many times, right? Same way with our best friends. Same way with the people that we work with. We know those people. We know why they do things. We know why they were walking down that road to Jericho and were mugged. We know all their sins as well as all their victories. But Jesus also teaches us to love those that we do not know. I wish that I could report that I always do that, but I don't always do that. I know that some of you might be better at doing that than I am. I don't know. I do help a lot of people. If I'm really kind of objectively looking at it, I do help a lot of people, not because I'm so good. But this is why I think that I... Stop to help somebody that's changing a tire, somebody that's out of gas, or I'm the guy that takes the risk that picks up the hitchhiker all the time. And why do I do that? Why do I help people who are without money, people who are homeless? I don't quiz them as to their story. Um, why do I put up people sometimes in, in a uh, hotel who are out on the street? Why would I do that? Well, Every instance, I was impressed with my own need for the grace of God. And in every instance, it reminds me once again that God is a God of grace and that we don't have what we have because we are better or more skilled or smarter or more moral people, but we are who we are and we have what we have by God's grace. And when we help someone else, it's that mini lesson in grace at that moment that we realize how God has put together the universe, that he's the one that gives and we are the one that receives. So here's our takeaway for today, I think. To love everyone and someone is a gift of grace. And if we are going to live in grace, then we will see the people and realize that they are no different than what we are and we realize our relationship with our Heavenly Father and that He gives to us as we need, not as we deserve. Let's sit in prayer for that for a minute. As deep cries out